welcome everyone to another Art of Thought podcast. Today, episode 9, recorded on September 5th, 2018. It is the first podcast of September, and arguably getting close to fall over here on the east coast of the U.S. Um, trees are changing. Today, talking about, I'm, I'm solo today, but I'm talking about um, DSLRs versus the smartphone camera. I'm talking about it in the broad sense of the term, in that... Uh, a lot of journalists, um, you know, I can include myself as a journalist. Um, a lot of journalists say, and there's a lot of talk about whether smartphone cameras that are are getting so good that you just event you just don't need a DSLR. You can do. I have seen some uh, camera exhibit, not camera, but uh, photo exhibitions that have been done solely on an iPhone. So, what I'm going to talk about is I am going to compare the differences i'm going to be talking about the latest of um and i'm going to be talking about the camera the the mirrorless cameras mainly um because those are the newest ones that do almost just as well as um almost just as well as regular dslrs with the exception of battery life those things are pretty bad on battery life um i'm talking based on experience because i do own a sony a7 mark ii or a7 ii um and i also own an a77 ii and i've used a canon t7i and I've used the Canon like 5D Mark IV and all that stuff. I've used a lot of cameras in my days. I'm not even that old. So let me be comparing the latest cameras and I'm start off with some basic news here. So today, ironically, perfect timing, Canon finally released their competitor um, to the Sony a7 III and to the Nikon or Nikon um, Z7 and Z6. And they call that the Canon R, or the Canon ES, EOS R, EOS R. It's a mirrorless camera. You can change the lenses is what it means. And it's got just a mirror that doesn't move, but it's a full frame camera. Uh, some basic specs of it. Um, it is a 30.3 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor, um, eight image processor. So it's got good low light uh, performance. It also, I'm looking at this based right off of Canon's website because they finally updated the page and it's there. It's got a touchscreen LCD that finally, the one thing that I've been looking for is that it articulates. Um, it, it literally, you can see yourself. If you have to record something yourself or you're vlogging, you can finally see yourself. Uh, you can turn the screen out and view yourself, which is really nice. That's what no other camera does right now that's mirrorless. Um, Another thing, it's got 4K video capture. It's got a touchscreen, like I said. Um, it says here it's, it uses a new lens mount. It's called RF lenses, but apparently you can still use your Canon uh, Canon EF lenses. Um, if I said that right, it's got 3.2 inch, a 3 by 2 clear view uh, screen, raw and JPEG in cam, raw to JPEG in camera. It says high frame rate, frame rate, full HD, so you can do 120p. Uh, or 120 FPS HD full HD video. Um, it says EOS Movie, which is 4K plus full HD. Uh, I'm not sure whether that means you can record both, or you can just um, at the same time, or you can just do one or the other. Um, it says here up to eight frames per second in one shot mode, which is pretty much a burst capture. ISO 40,000 uh, up to 40,000 uh, compared to the other ones, which I won't compare yet. 4K ISO, I guess it's for video. So for video, or no, 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 for, for picture is 40,000 ISO. For video, 25,600 uh, 2, uh, 1080p ISO. And for 4K, you can do 12,800 ISO up to that point. I wonder how grainy that would be. They got a broad range of lenses. They say EF and EFS lenses are compatible when purchasing your camera or your fifth uh, your first EOS camera, your fifth ESLR, ESR is designed to smoothly use your existing systems. Uh, when using EFS lenses, the ESR crops automatically to the reflect APS-C. So yeah, um, it, it, has, it says it maintains complete compatibility with EF and EFS lenses by using one of three optional mount adapters. So it doesn't just work by itself, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a mirrorless camera. It's much smaller than your 5D Mark IV. And yeah, it's pretty dope. It just came out today. So that's pretty cool. I wish I could get my hands on it. Maybe when I go to New York, I'll take a look at B&H. Um, so I'm comparing also to the a7 III. Let me see if I can uh, record my screen correctly. Let me see if so I can. you guys can view it, view what I'm looking at. Let me do this. 
we're gonna go desktop mode what is happening here let us stretch this uh, having some technicals where is there it is okay fit the screen that's much better well nope nope wrong wrong thing it's not it doesn't it doesn't want that window this is what you call technical difficulties there we go that's better okay so taking a look at it um yeah so i have here let me make sure my microphone is actually like on because for all you know it could be just okay so here comparing it also to the a7 III, sony just released that uh, i think last year or this year i'm not sure i, I don't remember um similar price point so the EOS R costs, let's see, costs about 29, no, 2200, 2300 dollars. And then we have the the A7 III, which costs body only two thousand dollars. Shoots 4K, has a touch screen, um, uh, HDR 24 megapixel as opposed to 30, 10 FPS burst as compared to eight, and 51,200 as compared to 40,000 in pictures for the ISO. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty cool camera, uh, because I have a similar camera, the a7 II, um, I can pretty much say I'm completely familiar with this camera because it's the exact same body style, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the general thing since this has already been out you can get it by itself on um, body only for, you know, $2,000 and it is a full frame mirrorless camera so it has you know good low light and then we switch over to the Canon Z the Nikon Z6 Nikon Z6 as well is basically the counterpart exact direct counterpart to the Sony a7 III oops oh my goodness I almost broke my phone <laughs> um Canon Z Nikon Z6 I keep calling it Canon Nikon Z6 body only let me make sure it's body only yep Body only is two thousand dollars, just like the Sony. Um, but is so these two are much cheaper than the Nikon or the Canon. And this is going to be the worst in me names. Um, it's not out yet, but you can pre-order it. You scroll down more, you can see more about it. It's got twelve uh, FPS continuous shooting, so that's a nice burst. Sony's is ten, and uh, Canon's is eight. So that's that's pretty. That's pretty good. That's that's actually really good. It shoots 4K. Um, it has up to 51,200. Uh, so same as Sony, but it's got higher FPS burst, and it's got 24.5 megapixel where Sony's is 24.2 or three. You know, it's got Bluetooth built in. It's got 4K and Wi-Fi, just like all the other cameras. However, does it have a touchscreen? Is the question. Um, let's see the back screen doesn't look like it articulates at all um let me see does it have a touch screen blah 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 nope does not it's it's weather sealed which is pretty dope um no it doesn't have a touch screen so the the interesting thing about this camera is going to be that for the price you get it's pretty on par with it makes it look like so far the canon is not worth it because the Canon is not as high ISO, even though you may not even be shooting that high. And also, the only one thing different with the Canon would be that the screen is just what exactly I would want. But it just costs $300 more than both of the other ones, body only. Um, so you got 51, and then you got the same thing here. So comparing to that, now we're going to the, the phone route. This is the iPhone 10, because the iPhone 10 is the big competitor. It's the only one from Apple that's not Android, obviously. Um, 5.8 inch screen. It does HDR display. It's it's got a 4K camera as well. I think it does 4K 60. Let me see. I believe it has 4K 60. Um, uh, video recording. There it is. Okay. So it does 4K 60, which is on top of all both of all three of those cameras. It's it's better in terms of the FPS of 4K. If that's your thing. Uh, 1080p. It can do up to 60. 720 recording at 30 that doesn't make any sense at all that that really doesn't make any sense at all why why 720p at, at 30 fps i don't know if apple's website is wrong because let me let me go onto my camera here 
and I'm going to go record video. Oh no, I guess it all is dirty, and then I guess slow mo would be the 240 uh, FPS. So I guess so. Um, so you got that, and then you also have uh, flash, unlike the other two. So if you're in dark place, you don't have to carry a bulky camera or giant flash with you to light up the area. Um, stabilization, just like the other ones, they all have stabilization in it. Um, obviously, this one's water resistant as well. 4K recording, but you can take pictures while doing it. I think you can do that with some of the other ones as well. Um, yeah, and then you also have you have two lenses, you know, built in obviously. So it's got uh, f f 1.8. It's got f 2.4 telephoto. So general thought um, for those of you who don't know what camera terminology is, um, f stop f stop controls how much light gets into your sensor. So or not how much light ISO does that, but f stop. If the lower your f stop, um, you're gonna have say f 1.8 is gonna be much better bokeh, um, which is like the blurred background that you see in a lot of photos and a lot of things. And for telephoto um, and f 2.4, f 2.4, it's gonna be a little bit darker of an image, but you're gonna get more in um, you're gonna get more in focus. So there won't be there'll be less of a blur but not that much. So that's the difference between that. Um, so it's got two, both of those built in because it's a phone. Um, portrait lighting, so you don't have to have like a green screen. You can just kind of take a picture and put whatever you want behind you. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, front facing as well, so you can do your selfies. So basically in replace of Canon's, um, you know, articulating screen that you can look at yourself, you can also look at you know you can obviously look at yourself because you have the phone facing you the screen facing you which is pretty cool and so that's that's another thing so we're looking here um 1080p front facing um it's a f 2.2 which is cool auto hdr which is nice they all, all the other cameras also have hdr built in high dynamic range um image stabilization which is good face detection which is good the other cameras also have that timer mode which is also good and burst mode so this already has pretty much everything the other three have already built in but this is a smaller package um next up you're going to the pixel 2 the google pixel 2 um apparently according to i think dp review and um what is that camera lens uh the camera lens comparison website that they compare all the lenses and they give like a number for it in terms of how good it is apparently the pixel 2 has the best image quality of any smartphone to date still and it only has one lens because it google does a lot of software things built in uh, as you take the picture um so this has apparently the best the best camera um of all of them in this one camera here is a 12.2 megapixel f 1.8 aperture um and then i don't even know what this means right here i i can't tell i don't remember what this means here but 1.4 that i don't even know what to say about that but i'm going to say it's f 1.8 aperture and 12.2 megapixel whereas the iphone is for camera rec camera pictures is 12 megapixel um and it's got both 1.8 and 2.4 aperture cuz this only has one lens here and then Making it simple because you know, you know, one needs to see all that. It is a six inch screen, I didn't even believe it. Um, going on to the latest phone from Samsung, we also have the Galaxy Note 9. Uh, Samsung is saying it's amazing. Um, so yeah, so here it is Samsung's Galaxy Note 9, the front camera in this order that the website says, says that it is. Uh, 8 megapixel autofocus and it's a uh, sensor of uh, one 3.6 inch um, and also it is a 4 by 3 ratio so obviously if you have your monitor if you look at an example of your monitor your monitor right now most guaranteed is probably 16 by 9 which is like 1920 by 1080 resolution I have two monitors here and one of my monitors is a 21 by 9 because it's an ultra wide one so I can show as much things as possible on the screen. And then I have another one that's 16 by 9, 1080. Um, and this is a 4 by 3 ratio, so that means that any picture you take is not exactly going to fit in the frame of your monitor. Um, it's going to be a little bit like with little black bars on the side, unless you zoom in. 
but that's how most cameras are nowadays. I'm sure you can change it to um, 16 by 9 as well. Um, it's got a 80 degree field of view, 1.7 aperture. So if you compare it to the Pixel 2, which is actually 1.8, and the iPhone, which is 1.8 and 2.4, this actually has a deeper aperture in that you're going to have some more bokeh in your images. So it's going to look more like f professional, you know, the professional look that everyone likes to see. Um, don't really care about the gimmicks of selfie focus and selfie wide selfie stuff. So now we're looking at the nitty gritty stuff. That was just the front camera. The back camera, 12 megapixel autofocus sensor. So the front camera has an 8 megapixel and the back camera has a 12. Uh, you also have a 1.5 dual aperture, 1.5 and 2.4, as opposed to iPhones, 1.8 and 2.4. So I'm sure one of them is a wide angle and the other one is a telephoto sensor. In fact, I was correct right there. In fact, no, that's just for the uh, wide angle sensor. Wow, that's amazing. Um, another thing that you can see here, it says here the Galaxy Note 9 is a 12 megapixel as well for the telephoto lens. So they're both 12 megapixel lenses, um, 4 by 3 ratio, and then you have 2.4 apertures. So you have so many apertures to deal with, and you can automatically switch on the fly. That's what I heard on Samsung's website, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so that was the that was the technical mumbo jumbo of all of it. But now I'm gonna get into uh, more things. So let me see. Let me just give you guys a a picture of the Galaxy Note 9, just so that hey, you can you can see what it looks like. So let me actually scroll down. They don't they clearly don't like showing pictures of their own phone. Uh, yeah, it's got a pen, whatever. So Galaxy Note 9, that's the back. Um, they don't they don't like showing their own phone. So, I'm gonna switch to here. Okay, so this continuing this thing, I brought in the mumbo jumbo about the tech specs because people have to know what that is um, before I get into the actual comparison. So, in comparing DSLR versus smartphone, uh, one of the big things that people bring up is that. Uh, but you can have as many lenses as possible. One of the big comparisons is that um, you can just get as many lenses as you want for a DSLR and have whatever aperture you want um, anytime you want as long as you have the lens, even if you rent it or whatever it is, buy it. Um, whereas a smartphone camera, you're limited to whatever they've given you. Um, and also the customization of your pictures, you're limited to whatever you're, they've given you. So one thing that all three of these phones do is all three of these phones, all three of these phones or all, yeah, all three of these phones and all three of these cameras all let you um, shoot in RAW. Uh, and RAW is the default, is like a, has the most information. And one thing that you can see if you don't do photography at all is that um, when you shoot in RAW and you're going in to edit it, whether it's in Lightroom or Adobe Bridge or Photoshop, whatever it is, um, you'll notice that, uh, You'll notice that when you go to say white balance, you actually, one, you have a bigger image, like the, the size of the file is much larger, probably like 30 megabytes. But two, you have more things you can deal with. So because there's more information is what people say, um, the white balance option is not just auto and manual. The white balance then gives you an option for like sunset, night, um, cloudy, shade, all this stuff. It gives you a lot of options to modify just that even the white balance. Uh, so that's a major thing that if if you're taking pictures, for instance, for like a news publication or anything like that, n most news publications, they, they they like a certain kind of feel for the um, picture, like their company has a certain feel they want. If the company is a really company that is kind of, you know, somber and calm. They probably want to go more on the bluest side of the spectrum. And you can just manually customize it and make it blue. But if you just want to switch the white balance automatically to make it blue, like afterwards, if you only shoot in JPEG regular, you are not going to have that option. And you're going to have to just go in Photoshop and actually put like a blue filter over it, which takes more time. And, you know, time is money. Um, and no one wants to deal with that. Another thing that you have to deal with is the size difference um, and the amount of things you got to carry. So obviously DSLR. Unless you got like an 18 to 240 or 18 to 135 millimeter lens, um, 
you're probably going to be carrying more than one lens. Therefore, you'll probably be carrying a bag of some sort, whether it's a backpack or anything like that, messenger bag. Whereas a smartphone, you just put it in your pocket and take it out, take a picture and put it back. That's all you have to do. Um, and then another thing, too, is if you want to edit it on the field, um, we do have options on smartphones like iPhone. That's like uh, Google Snapseed. Um, you also have options like Adobe Lightroom on iPhone and um, Android. No, Lightroom is only available, I believe, on iPhone, but Snapseed is available on Android as well. There's a number of things like Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, like the mobile one, that allows you to just ba do basic uh, modifications to it and even have filters over your thing. You can do that all from your smartphone right when you take the picture, whereas if you're on a DSLR, yeah, they have NFC and yeah, they have Wi-Fi Direct and all that stuff where you can connect it to your phone, but there's more steps you got to deal with. And if you don't want to go through those steps and you just want to customize deeply, you do have to just, um, you have to take out your laptop or something and, and insert the SD card or whatever card format it takes and put it in that laptop um, and start working that way. So you have to carry more stuff with the DSLR. So if you're like doing a news thing, um, if you're doing a, say, uh, okay, let's say if you're doing a real estate thing, you're doing a real estate gig and you're just like, man, um, all I have to do is take pictures of each room and make it look nice. Chances are, there's a good chance you probably don't need your DSLR. Um, nowadays, you probably just need your smartphone because the smartphone is going to take good enough pictures. Um, you're not shooting a model or anything like that. It's good enough pictures, so you don't have to deal with it. Um, whereas if you're shooting like a model or you're going out on the field and you're doing like a paparazzi thing, it's a good chance you don't want to whip out your smartphone because one, that thing will get hit and dropped immediately. No neck strap for smartphones. Whereas DSLR, you can get some kind of strap to keep it on you. And in case someone bumps into you, it's still going to be fine. Uh, most of the time. And so that's another major difference between the two is that you're just carrying more with the DSLR, um, and that's why a lot of news things. I was talking to my sister, and I was hearing, I think from The Verge as well, um, that our smartphone is going to eat away the professional photographer market. You know, our professional photographer is going to be less and less needed because smartphones are getting so much better. Um, and right now, I can say no, because I can gladly say that because there's so many range of lens choices and sometimes you want to pretty much like telescope in like spy style and look at like the top of a building creepily um, with like your 600 millimeter lens. You're doing sports photography where you need a fast pace one eight thousandth of a second or three thousandth of a second. Um, what if you want to do that? You can't do that with a smartphone right now without it being extremely grainy, whereas a DSLR, it's got more space. It's got more. Um, depth and so you can zoom in a lot and still be crisp not grainy not anything and you'll be able to have clear um, everything so like it's just it, it's a big thing you're not going to be able to do that with a smartphone anytime soon because you got it they're trying to keep smartphones thin whereas DSLR is they're trying to make them smaller because there is space to shrink them with the mirrorless ones especially um, but they're still the top-notch choice because your lens has all the space it needs in case you want to zoom in or zoom out and do this and do that, compose your shot correctly and everything like that. Um, just based on my experience, I know I will sometimes, like with my Sony, I will connect it to like the uh, the app store it built into the thing and I will um, download like the, what's it called, the Sony smart remote, whatever it is, and that basically allows me to connect my smartphone or whatever device, whether it's an iPad or whatever it is, to that camera, and then I can take pictures, raw images, um, from my Sony using the Sony's um, lenses, and it just transfers the pictures automatically to my smartphone, and then from there I can edit. So sometimes I'll do that. I'll literally be on the field, and I'll have like a little like tripod set up, um, and I'll just connect my camera, my DSLR to like I have this plastic cheap thing that I just hook to the top of the cold shoe mount and I'll just uh, aim the smartphone at me as if it's a bigger screen which it is um, and then I'll be able to like take pictures just like that my phone is going off like crazy um, and I'll do that and just just so that way I can um, you know modify and do more things on the fly without having to have a giant device with me like a laptop and stuff it's nice and all to have a laptop but Sometimes you just don't want to carry all that because you have enough to carry. So 
the dilemma between smartphone and DSLR, the traditional camera, one big thing is um, the amount to carry. Um, it's just a night and day difference in what you have to carry. And you can either just keep it in your pocket or you can just, uh, you know, take it out, use it real quick, and put it back in your pocket. Whereas camera, like traditional camera, DSLR, you have to put it in a bag. You have to carry multiple lenses if you need to do multiple things, like a wedding or whatever it is. You have to do that kind of stuff. Most top or higher end cameras, they don't have flash built in because the built in camera flash is just not good. So, what do you have to do if you want to shoot in low light areas? Take out a uh, speed light flash, those giant ones that fold and stuff, and use that flash instead. So, that's more you got to carry. So, if you want to save space and you just are not a super camera, uh hobbyist i would just say go with the smartphone because it's gonna do the job it's gonna be great um let me take a sip and then i'll get into uh i'll get into the next bullet point that i have in my head uh, this water tastes really good actually a little protein shake so talking about dslr versus the smartphone camera on the Art of Thought podcast. Um, I don't know if I introduced myself. Like I said, I am Kwaku. Um, and yeah, this is this is that uh, this is that podcast. So what we're doing here is comparing DSLRs versus smartphones in terms of their camera. What's better for you? I can't make the ultimate decision for you, but I can tell you some things to just you know, guide you one side or another to see which one is best for you, make the right purchase. So we talked about how, um, I talked about how uh, they take up more space, you know, DSLR, because there's a lot more things you got to carry versus a smartphone. And the battery life is terrible compared to a smartphone and sometimes um, for at least for mirrorless. But now uh, the next step is image quality. So I was talking about f-stop um, and in fact, let me do this thing real quick. I was talking about f-stop and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a direct thing here. Uh, let me see. There we go. Okay, so I have here. I'm going to switch over. I have here, I'm on digitalphotographyschool.com. Hopefully they can better explain it for me, uh, for you guys. And here you'll see stuff about f-stops. F-stops is pretty much the opening in your lens. Uh, I wish I could connect my Sony camera so you guys could see like exactly what's going on. But I don't have that kind of light right now. So you'll see f1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5.6, and so on. Uh, so the larger the aperture, it means the smaller the number, and the bigger the aperture, or the smaller the aperture, the bigger the number. It's kind of confusing even when I was in school and I was trying to learn that. I couldn't grasp that the bigger number is actually smaller, but that's what it means. So, um, yeah. So basically, when you get a larger aperture, which means, uh, say, 1.4 is much larger than f8, um, you'll get more light coming in, so your images will generally be a lot brighter. Um, so you have to tweak some other settings like your, uh, your what is the word I'm looking for? Your ISO you have to tweak, you'd have to tweak your shutter speed to tweak, um, you'd have to do a lot. So, so you'll have to increase your shutter speed just to make it right. So, but one thing is with smartphones on the other hand, uh, smartphones and DSLRs, uh, most people think that you can't actually customize the settings on your those cameras, but you actually can. Um, smartphones, it's a fixed aperture for the most part. Um, you have mo like if you have two lenses, you have two apertures, you know, most of the time. And if, with that, with DSLRs, traditional DSLRs, you can switch on the fly between a range of apertures. And when you're buying lenses for those kind of for those cameras. Um, what if they give you like it's a f1.4 um, like 35 millimeter lens that means that it's a 35 millimeter lens um, which is like not super wide angle but it's kind of wide angle um, and the biggest opening that the camera lens can do 
is f 1.8 1.4 um but you can it's variable so that means it can change you can change it to 2 2.8 4 5.6 8 16 and so on um so you can you can manually just change it um to whatever one you want but the biggest opening it'll have is 1.4 so that's what it looks like when you're buying like camera lenses um smartphone you can do that however the one difference is that you have to download an app and most of the times the apps that are good out there they are what is it called they they cost money um so let me i'm pulling out my iphone right now and i'm i haven't downloaded any app because i just use my actual camera to take pictures like that but um, let me see something about manual camera. So if you want a manual camera app, I'm seeing here on the App Store specifically that there's a good app called ProCam, ProCam 5. And it allows you to switch your shutter speed, ISO, um, and stuff like that, your white balance settings, turn on HDR, switch between RAW, and all that stuff. Just like a DSLR, only it's on your phone. So, But this one costs $6 to buy. Um, and it allows you to change all those settings that you can do. You can even do focus peaking and all that stuff. And I'm not going to get into any of that stuff because um, this is not a photography podcast. Um, but, yeah, you can switch between all that stuff. And it's it's pretty amazing. So you can you can tweak a lot, a lot of settings. You can do long exposures. You can do a lot. That actually looks really cool. So you, you can do quite a bit of things. Um and on a DSLR, you can do the same thing. You just look for the right, the button or the um, the dial that lets you switch between those settings, and you can do it all in the DSLR. So in those ways, it is the same. However, um, like I was saying before, you have more options in terms of f-stop or aperture. Um, in that, if you buy a different lens, it'll have a different f-stop, uh, a different opening size. Like the largest size, it could be different. Um, so if you buy, a, uh, they have f-stops that are like 0.9, which means that the bokeh in the camera, which is the blurring factor pretty much, is going to be amazing. Like uh, the subject is going to be in sh deep focus and the background is literally going to be blurry like like you were super drunk and you almost blacked out blurry. Like it's going to be, it's going to be very blurry. Um, so it's, that's a really nice, really nice thing to have. Uh in terms of that but only thing is the lens is going to cost you a ton of money to get that kind of thing lenses aren't cheap for full frame cameras lenses are between like the the good lenses are between 500 and like two thousand dollars and that's a lot of money uh, whereas you know your iphone by itself is going to cost a thousand dollars your galaxy note 9 is going to cost a thousand dollars the google pixel 2 is going to cost you 800 to 900 dollars but you'll get a good package in and then it also does obviously more things like phone calling and texting and all that stuff um, but if you're looking at it in terms of camera I'd say um, depends on what you need and again if you want that that if you want that difference between being able to be flexible and being able to just switch uh, without paying for a six dollar app but six versus a thousand dollars you know gotta take the pick um, if you want that difference um, you then have to uh, you then have to just make your decision. How much money do you have? If you have about, I want to say, if you have about, uh, you have about twelve hundred dollars laying around. You know that you're like, I want to get a good camera. I want it to be portable. I want it to have a uh, good image quality. Um, I want it to have a all right battery life. Like it'll last you the amount of time you're gonna use it. You're not gonna use it eight hours straight. So you'll have time to charge in the middle. I want it to shoot 4K video. Um, we're getting into the recommendation section now um, of this podcast. I honestly say one of my big uh, ones that a lot of people te tend to like for 4K video and all that stuff um, and good image quality is the Sony A6300 or A6300 because that camera is smaller than even these full frame mirrorless cameras, which aren't even that big. The ergonomics are not that great, but smartphone ergonomics are not that great. Um, and it's got a touch screen. You know, it doesn't have a touch screen, but you can do all the setting changes. You can change all the stuff. It's pretty much a, a full frame. It's pretty much like a, it's pretty much a DSLR camera. Only thing is, it's a crop sensor, so the the amount of information in the image is actually a lot, a little smaller. You don't get as much picture in the picture, but you don't get as much picture in. Uh, a smartphone either it's gonna some things are gonna be cut out naturally 
Um, you can change the lenses. It's really nice. 4K capture, I think 120 FPS, um, 1080p. It's got some slow-mo and it's got all that stuff built in and it's much smaller. In fact, I was looking at that. It's got everything you want and that would be the camera that I would say you should get. Um, and it costs, you can get it for like, I want to say 700, between 700 and 1000 depending on what you're doing with it. Um, and then once you jump up to 1200 you're getting into the A6500, which has a touchscreen um, and an image stabilization. Um, so I would say get the A6300 as one of the choices. The other choice is, what is it called? The Panasonic GX85. I would say pick up that. So I'm bringing it up right now. So the Panasonic GX85 right here. Uh, you can see here on this Google search, let me bring it up on Panasonic's official website. I think they have some deals going on right now. Yep. So if you're looking for 4K in a mirrorless form factor, if you're looking for mirrorless is just, you know, the, the, the little flap, the mirror inside, if you take the lens off, it doesn't go up or anything. It stays the same. Um, if you're looking for that, but it's not full frame, um, then the GX85 is also a good choice because Right now, they have a huge sale, apparently. You can get a 12, 32 mil millimeter lens, which is very wide angle, very good for vlogging um, lens, and 16 megapixel. It's not the 24, like the um, A6300. Dual image stabilization and viewfinder, Wi-Fi, yada, for $600. So it's not bad. It's And it's got six axis uh, body stabilizer. So that means that when you're doing video, it'll be pretty solid. Um, you can do that. Um, or you can... Uh, and it comes with lenses too. It comes with the 12 to 32 millimeter, like I said. Um, they have choices. Let me see. I believe it came with more than one lens, but I guess not. Um, and then obviously this is direct from Panasonic's website. Uh, you can also probably you can find it other other places as well. So it's either the A6300 or that. Um, they're both pretty equal, I'd say. Um, the, the megapixel, the quality of the image is going to be less. Um, you're not going to have as much detail because it's lower megapixel but it's going to be good enough if you just want to show it off to family good chance that if you're getting these cameras is you're not you're not really worried about doing it for like professionalism you're just doing it because you're a hobbyist you just like taking pictures which is fine um so that's that's a choice i would say in terms of smartphone in terms of camera for those devices uh depending on your price point i would probably choose the note 9 if you have just an endless price point for uh for phones uh, to get something with a good camera and a good all-around package with a good battery life. The Galaxy Note 9 from Samsung is the most likely one of the best choices. If you purely just want camera, it's kind of an older phone, you can get the Pixel 2 XL, um, which, let me see how much it'll cost you. Uh, it's not actually telling me. I think it's about $800. Um, or you can get the iPhone 10, which actually they have an event next week. In fact, next week, the 12th, they have an event, which is, ironically, the same day as this podcast. So um, I'll probably be doing a live show for the podcast, uh, another live show, talking directly about the iPhone event from Apple, because it lies on the same day. Um, I'll do it probably the same time as what they do it. So those are your choices right now. I would hold off on getting an iPhone right now um, if you're trying to get camera, because the prices are going to drop because of starting next week because of the new devices and on top of that um you can see if you want the new devices over the old one which is this one it's only a year old it's still really good and really nice um so those are your choices for camera the only other camera that i would say is all right for the price let me actually bring it up for you guys is the uh one plus so here it is this is the one plus six and i think the one plus six t is coming out soon they have some discounts. It's a really nice phone. Um, it's got two cameras on the back, just like every other device. It's cheaper than everything else. Um, let me pull it up real quick. It has here, wait for it to load. It doesn't seem like it wants to load. There we go. So the tech specs. It's got here a nice large screen, 16 and 20 megapixel dual camera. It's got a lot of space, a lot of uh, memory to make it fast um, for longer periods of time. Fast charging, it's got everything. Um, where is the camera stuff? There it is. It's a Sony camera lens uh, sensor. Um, it's got 16 megapixel main sensor. 
and it's also got another secondary sensor 20 megapixel um which is really dope really nice they both have a 1.7 aperture so it's much it's a little larger than um pretty much every camera that i've talked about so far it's it's compared to the 1.8 or anything like that it's a little larger um it's got 4k 60 1080 60 it's got 720p 30 slow-mo 1080 at 240 uh 720p slow-mo at 480 it's got a little video editor built in obviously it's android as well so you can get all the android stuff um you can share it easy and everything like that front camera is 16 which is amazing for the price that you're paying nearly you're paying half of the amount of the iphone and the galaxy note 9 and you get all of these features for camera um aperture is 2.0 for the front fixed focus you can't really change the focus of it so i'd say um i don't know the image quality of it exactly but for anyone watching this and they're trying to figure out what camera they want to use for like a trip um and they don't mind it being a phone i'd say it's one of these phones one of these phones or one of these cameras here if you don't mind carrying more a lot more you're going to be going with one of these three is what i would highly recommend if you have a lot endless amounts of money you're trying to be professional two thousand dollars and two thousand three hundred dollars um if you are trying to save space and you don't have that kind of money i would say what is that sound that is really loud i would say um go with you know the panasonic lumix gx85 um and yeah so i'd say do that so those are my choices that's what i would recommend um for your choices um if you're looking for it more budget but still kind of expensive this is a very loud uh podcast going on in the background um i would say go ahead and just you know do it that way just you know get the one plus six and call it a day it's much cheaper so yeah so if you guys are looking for any recommendations for anything like that let me know i can probably guide you in some way figure out what kind of device you want for whatever it is you're doing in this case is for cameras um I'd say for the journalist field, um, depending on what you're doing, if you're just doing like, um, if you're doing journalism, I'd say just go with like mirrorless camera because it's smaller, although the lenses are going to be more expensive. You can do camera mount adapters to use whatever camera lens you want. Um, if you're going for like real estate in general like that, um, I'd say just go with the DSLR, um, get some mirrorless thing, like I said, or get a regular DSLR like a 60 mark ii or whatever it is depending on your price point um you can change the lenses you can do everything all the settings changes you just have to have an extra computer next button nearby just to edit which is fine if you're doing professional work um and if you are trying to travel and you want to take pictures um a lot they do have point and shoots out there which there are really nice point and shoots out there um but this one was mainly for the dslr um, I'll give you some recommendations on that one in another show, or maybe the post show of this. Um, so the nice point and shoots out there, like the Sony RX100, uh, the Sony UX99 or HX99 and stuff, they're just coming out. Um, you can get that, uh, and that's going to shoot 4K. That's going to do all the work that you want to do. I think Panasonic themselves, I think they even have a, let me see if I can find it they even have a point and shoot that is going to work for you so if i go here uh let's see if i can find it so if you want like the zs200 panasonic um it's got a lot of the features you just can't edit your photo like you can't tweak your photos in the camera it's going to be a little bit more than uh than the GX85, where the GX85 comes with lenses right now, but it's on back order. In fact, all of these are. Um, if you're looking for that, uh, there's a lot of choices out there. There's a lot of choices. You just kind of have to see which one. Panasonic, Sony RX series, or UX series, whatever it's called, UX99. Um, Canon has them, but I don't think anyone really buys the Canon point and shoots really anymore. They just kind of go with DSLR with them. So Panasonic and Sony is what people are buying nowadays, I've noticed. Uh, in terms of small point and shoots, because those are t seem like the best ones. They have good image quality and it will work perfectly for what you're doing. Um, so take a look at some recommendations. Take a look at the Sony, what is it called? The Sony RX100 Mark VI. If you have a lot of money to blow and you just don't need money, go with that. It's got a nice lens in it and it's got nice zoom. It's got, I think it's 
I think it's like 18 to 240 zoom or something like that, or 24 to 240 or one something zoom. It's crazy um, in a point and shoot. Otherwise, go with the Panasonic GX85 um, for any other choice like that. Um, and yeah, this has been the Art of Thought podcast, episode 9, um, recorded on September 5th, 2018, um, coming to the end of it. And yeah, if you guys have any, if anyone has any questions or any kind of recommendation things that they want to get or anything they want to get recommended to, to figure out what they want to get, let me know. This podcast is a general podcast. Talk about whatever is on my mind. And today just happened to be DSLR versus smartphone camera. I know it's a little technical, um, but this is, this is something that actually is my passion is cameras um, and technology and figuring out the difference between the the two and what's best to buy and things like that i try to put no bias in it even though i do use sony a lot so i did say sony more it's only because that's what i'm familiar with but i do i am familiar with all the other models all the other companies too so let me know what you guys think send me an email as always you can find me on twitter and instagram at that guy quay k-w-e it's going to be all together um so you can see that if you're watching it um in the post you can see that right below, right in front of you right now. Or uh, if you want to send me an email um, to let me know of how the show went or what you any recommendations, you can email the Art of Thought Podcast or the Art of Thought Official at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, and soon uh, the website will be live. The helixmedia.com will be live. It's currently in development right now. It's almost done. Um, and soon you'll be able to see the post notes on there. You can find this podcast on anywhere that podcasts are found. You can find it on Stitcher, TuneIn, not Spotify because it's a little weird over there. Um, Stitcher, TuneIn, you can find it on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Um, you can find it on YouTube, the video portion that shows when I am actually clicking on different links and showing you the in-depth info that you can pause anytime and just read yourself. Or you, And also the links will be in the show notes as well. So, yeah, hope you guys have a great day. Um, Yeah, I'm probably going to be streaming something else on my other channel. Um, My other channel being That Guy Quay. Same thing you see below. I have a Twitch channel for that. So you can take a look at there later on if you want to see what I'm up to. As always, my name is Kwaku, and I'll talk to you guys later.